Hi guys, welcome to CounterPoints, my name is Connor, and today we're going to be breaking down Death of Hope in its entirety. It's a Horus Heresy fan animation, and what it lacks in fluidity, it makes up for in sheer density of lore and phenomenal models. It was unfortunately cut short due to mixed reception, the incredible amount of work it demanded of the artist, and Games Workshop shutting down the fan animation community. I know the audience can be a bunch of fickle bastards, and trust me, I crave well-animated modeled Warhammer animations the same way other people crave food, but I want to give credit where it's due. The environments and models are fantastic, which makes it a shame that Mark Lewis Spark didn't partner with an animator and cinematographer because this really could have been a killer series. This episode is brought to you by Mastermind Models and Miniatures. They are a phenomenal paint studio out of Huntsville, Alabama, who are waiting for your commission idea. You know darn well that you're just going to spend another fortune on plastic gray kits that that are just gonna sit there in your pile of shame and it will take years to get them on the battlefield. Instead of procrastinating, let Mastermind Models and Miniatures bring your imagination to life. Go to the link down in the description below and tell them that we sent you. The heavens rained fire and with it delivered to us the 13th. Warrior kings of Ultramar slaughtering innocents. All that remains is but ash. False angels. boiled and the earth burned, my faith didn't die. It is the moment I began to believe. God was real. And he hated us. Storms you've managed to reach us. The status of your flotilla will be sent to our tech priests. If I may ask, the damages to your flotilla, what was it you fought? They raised monarchy onto the ground. Humbled our legion. We are here to return the favor. is often accused of being incredibly lore dense and therefore intimidating to newcomers. This animation takes that factor and cranks it up to 11, kicking off in one of the most chaotic moments during the Horus Heresy, one of the most complex narratives in the universe that sets up the conflicts 
for millennia to come. Not just that, but it picks as its protagonist the most narratively important legion of genetically enhanced super warriors that kick it all off, the word bearers. To keep this brief but informative, the human race conquered the stars in a high technology boom that reached across the galaxy known as the Dark Age of Technology. Over reliant on AI, mankind fought a devastating war against sentient machines known as the Men of Iron and regressed technologically. This climaxed right before the Age of Strife, also known as Old Night. The galaxy was racked by warp storms, making interstellar travel impossible. The Emperor of Mankind, an immensely powerful psychic being, emerged from that chaos and united and irradiated and destroyed Earth through the use of genetically enhanced warriors. This project culminated in the space marines, his transhuman warriors of incredible strength and power. The Emperor's ultimate goal was to conquer the stars for humanity, rid it of any competitors, and banish the religions and superstitions that had come out of old night. In order to create the space marines, the Emperor crafted sons for himself who would serve as generals to lead his armies and templates for the legions. Primarchs each had a function, and when adolescent males were implanted with genetic machines known as gene seed, they inherited a host of biological enhancements and often characteristics from their gene father. Just as the Emperor was completing his space brains, his sons were stolen from him. There are creatures in the warp that humans understand as gods, and dark gods of the warp stole the Primarchs and scattered them across the galaxy to play with the strands of fate. It was perhaps one of these strands of fate that was plucked when the Primarch of the Word Bears, Lorgar Aurelian, landed on a planet known as Colchis. Colchis was sophisticated and wealthy, but instead of holding warlords or merchants in high esteem, the most powerful of their society were priests, holy men who worshipped a pantheon of great power. Lorgar was adopted and mentored by an exiled priest known as Corferon, who recognized the power of the budding Primarch. Lorgar was an excellent student, but was stunned by visions of a golden figure coming to Colchis to free it from the tyranny of the priesthood. Lorgar believed the figure to be the one true god of humanity, and in preparation for his arrival, through powerful oratory and charisma, he converted many to the monotheistic faith of the god emperor and killed those who rivaled him. When the Emperor arrived, he was puzzled to find his son weeping and ready to serve in a compliant population, not embracing the secular imperial truth, but instead worshipping the Emperor as a god. The Emperor attempted to talk Lorgar out of his beliefs, something that would be heresy and punishable by death in any other circumstance, but Lorgar persisted and even stated that the Emperor's denial of his divinity was evidence of it. Unable to rid Lorgar of this notion, and needing to continue his great crusade, the Emperor charged his son with conquering the star in his name for the imperial truth, denying the existence of any gods. Lorgar was given command of the Imperial Heralds, a legion of warriors who were zealous fanatics when it came to destroying religions and spreading that truth. He renamed that legion the Word Bearers, and they continued a sacred mission. Over the course of decades, Lorgar did as his father asked, conquering new worlds in his name. But as he did so, he could not resist converting the population to the worship of the god Emperor. The zeal with which the Imperial Heralds had burnt the temples of pagan religions and put non-compliant worlds to the sword was slowly molded to the mission of the Word Bearers, promoting the Emperor's divinity. It became more and more important and more and more rewarding over time until Lorgar's conquest stagnated completely, alarming the Emperor's commanders. When the Emperor found out that his warrior son, his perfectly gene-crafted general, had been creating a new religion instead of destroying them, he was furious. He sailed in the company of the Ultramarines to Monarchia, the greatest city ever built by Lorgar. Monarchia was a towering hive city made of marble and gold. Once there, the Ultramarines gave six days for the city to be emptied. Those civilians that resisted were butchered, and on the seventh day, an orbital bombardment melted the city to slag and ash. The word bearers and their Primarch were summoned to that city and psychically forced to kneel in the destruction of their faith. When they looked up, they saw a glaring Emperor of Mankind and his loyal lapdogs, the Ultramarines. This is the bitterness and hatred that fueled this massacre and the Horus Heresy.
fight is with me, traitor. War dog! Come on, then, get a bit simple. Take me from my home, and I will sail to the stars of your empire. I will serve as a son must serve. But let Kulkis stand as I have shaped it, a planet of peace and prosperity. I will kill you where you stand. Loyalist scum! Come! Meet your death, cousins! Come! Meet your death, cousins! Lorgar mourned the loss of Monarchia and his humiliation for a month. At the encouragement of his adoptive father Corferon, he entered the warp in search of gods worthy of his worship. When the word bearers emerged, they cut a bloody swath into their assigned territories, reinvigorating their reputation amongst the legions. In their wake, they created secret cults who had returned to the pantheon of Colchis and the worship of the dark gods of the warp. Through manipulation, murder, and intrigue, the word bearers infected the Space Marine Legions until they had converted half of the Emperor's forces, knowingly or unknowingly, to the service of the Dark Gods. When Horus Lupercal was mortally wounded by a demonic blade and brought back to life by the Dark Gods, the plan was set in motion to conquer the stars in the name of Chaos, forces that were as old as existence itself. The Ultramarines were the most numerous of the Great Legions and had a stellar and balanced reputation in both war and diplomacy. They conquered worlds, but through the mastery of logistics, they would provision mortal Imperial forces and iterators to secure compliance. As such, they were the greatest threat to Horus Lupercal's plans to kill the Emperor and take the Imperium for himself and the Dark Gods. To cripple the Ultramarines before they were even aware of the heresy, Horus dispatched the word bearers to Ultramar to muster at Legion strength to take on an orc threat. Some Ultramarines were hesitant to serve with their wayward kin, but others viewed this as an opportunity to heal the rift caused by the raising of Monarchia. The planet Kalth was picked as an assembly point as it was an up-and-coming planet in a civilized world with all the logistics hubs, manufactorums, and recruits needed to supply a campaign. There, the word bearers sprung their trap. Releasing a scrap code into Kalth's orbital and defensive arrays, they unleashed strikes on capital ships, orbital bombardments, and ambush massacres on ultramarines and mortals alike. The word bearers were even able to strike the command deck holding Primarch Robut Gilliman and launch him into the void of space in an attempt to kill him. The devastation was horrible and many marines and auxilia fell to demons and word bearers before they could even understand what was happening. Heroes of the Imperium emerged to rally the troops, including Anid Thiel. Thiel was an ultramarine under censure for creating tactics to kill fellow Astartes, but when the ambush was launched, his unorthodox way of thinking saved many lives. Gilliman survived the vacuum of space, rallied with the survivors, and in concert with Thiel, launched a devastating counter-assault against demons and traitors alike.
the Empress subjects you dismiss so easily. There's no room for order here. Only vengeance. Only justice.
Then we are nearly there. Correct. Have you recovered? I breathe. It will be enough. Prepare yourself.
We are witness to the insanity of the warp as molecules, demons, and butchered Astartes float alongside the hull of a warship. Some seem to be locked in their final moments, while others have been ripped apart and displayed as grisly trophies. A substantial amount of Astartes' action on Kalth happened in the void of space, as boarding crews were repelled by warriors maglocked to the hulls of ships. Marines used to the deafening noises of war had their guts vented into silent space by chain weapons and bolter fire. Marines, Dark Mechanicum and Cultus, walk by these horrible apparitions, unshielded and unintimidated by warp creatures, as they all serve the same dark gods. They are freed from these fears as the Marines are champions, the Dark Mechanicum are its blacksmiths, and the Cultus are the zealous servants of chaos. They prove their new loyalty by maiming, killing, and torturing loyalists, making them grisly displays of their warship. A noble ultramarine, cut in half and suspended by hooks, has to stare without eyelids at butchered children of of his world, and as his brothers are cut down in Colosseum style duels with world eaters. The word bearers and ultramarines share a personal and bitter history. The word bearers are the heralds of religious revelation, while the ultramarines were the perfect stewards of the Emperor's secular imperium. The rivalry between the ultramarines and the world eaters is less personal, but just as stark. The ultramarines are heavily influenced by great civilizations of humanity, in particular Rome. In aesthetic and custom, they try to bring the best in art, culture, trade, diplomacy, and war. This is directly contrasted to the World Eaters, the masters of butchery and slaughter. The World Eaters were known as the Warhounds early in the Great Crusade and were as loyal as they were fearsome. They were kept in reserve and only unleashed onto planets that needed to be raised to the ground. Their Primarch Angron was found on Nuceria and was enslaved as a child. His incredible size and strength were prized virtues in the fighting pits of the planet and he became a champion gladiator. Angron was implanted with the Butcher's Nails, cortical implants that greatly enhanced aggression and reflexes. He led a successful slave result, leading an army of gladiators against the ruling elite. Just as Angron was about to make a last stand, the Emperor teleported him away, leaving that gladiator army to slaughter, causing a bitter hatred by Angron for the Emperor, who he came to view as just another tyrant. In an attempt to gain favor with their gene father, Angron's legion recreated the Butcher's Nails for Space Marines and took on the name World Eaters. They never won their father's approval, but slaughtered whole planets to prove their worth. The World Eaters' preference for chain weapons and melee combat made them favored champions of the blood god Korn. In honor of the gladiators of Nuceria, the World Eaters loved to battle in Colosseum duels with fully edged weapons to prove their martial skill. A fleshhound of Korn, an emissary of the blood god himself, watches the bout and gorges on the flesh of the fallen ultramarine, excited to slake his thirst and bring his skull back to his god. A woman weeps for her lost child, tortured by the corrupted forces of the warp. She is stuck in this moment perpetually, attempting to soothe her boy who will not wake. She shakes her child to rouse him, but they are fused by mutation, stuck in an inescapable hell as dark gods laugh at their misery. An Eldar, a mortal loyalist, and an Ultramarine are all caged in cells awaiting their fates. The Eldar is bested in combat. The loyalist is saved by an alarm at the last moment, while the Ultramarine is able to kill two mortal servants of the Dark Gods before he is killed with a maul and his armor taken. The word bearer now wears the blue of the Ultramarines, ready to continue the Shadow Crusade, plunging a knife into the heart of the 500 worlds of Ultramar. There are dozens of details, all of them fascinating in this piece, which is actually part of the problem. We get glimpses into segments of lore that could take eons to explain. We see a servitor rebelling against a Dark Mechanicus tech priest. Is this a loyalist servitor rebelling against his new Dark Masters? We see a tortured Ultramarine calling out the word bearers by name. What hatred and vile deeds cut him in half and kept him alive to witness these horrors? What will become of the mortal loyalist? Will he escape his bloodthirsty captors or will he die quickly with a chain axe to the neck? Unfortunately, the best we know from where the series would have gone is from an episode two summary. This was going to be a flashback episode where we see word bears disguised as ultramarine slaughter confused loyalists. We would have seen the woman run through the battle to save her child, and we would see censured ultramarines and the mortal loyalists coordinate a counter assault against the traitors. This story unfortunately is lost partially because of the mixed reviews from fans, partially from Games Workshop's crackdown on fan animations, and partially because of the ambition of the project itself. Which brings us to the end for now. Like, share, and subscribe, comment down below, and if you can't think of anything, type in comment for the comment gods. I'll salute you in real life with an Oquilla. 
become a channel member on YouTube or help support us on patreon.com slash counterpoints. If you're a political nerd, check out the political channels down in the description and also be sure to support our sponsors. I appreciate you. Catch you in the next one. Until the end.